Coming up on Garden Talk. If I was to tell anybody what tools you should buy first, number one, obviously you need a light. Number two, I would say get a humidifier. Cool thing with auto flowers is you can run any light cycle you want to run. So you can run them for six hours a day, 10 hours a day, 20 hours a day, 24 hours a day. You can put them in your window still and still be successful and grow a full flower. Track everything, even if it's the stupidest thing, when lights go on, when they go off, how much water you give, when you give it, because all that is just intel and it's going to help you become a better gardener at the end of the day. Don't, don't, don't transplant. Just put them in their final pot, whether it be a three, a five, a 10, whatever pot you want to use. Then auto flower needs to get to where it needs to get within the first 22 days to 25 days. If they're not where you want them to be at that point, then chances are you're not going to get much yield. What's up everybody, if you that don't know me, my name is Chris, AKA Mr. Grout, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 32. In this episode, I interview grower Joe of Basement Auto Flowers. He has been gardening for five years and grows peppers, tomatoes, houseplants, and medicinal varieties. He specializes in growing auto flower plants, and that's what we're gonna get into today. He tries to keep things simple, and he talks about some of the easy methods that he uses for growing auto flower plants. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast to help make that goal possible. Big shout out to AC Infinity for sponsoring this podcast. AC Infinity is well known to produce high quality products and provide excellent customer service. They have the thickest grow tent on the market today, inline fans with a controller that can automatically turn on and off according to specific set points. They have seedling mats, trimmers, drying racks, and several other products that you can use in your garden. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. Thanks to Dutch Pro for sponsoring this podcast. Dutch Pro products are now available in several countries across the world. For those of you that don't know, Dutch Pro is a plant fertilizer company that has base nutrients, additives, and pH regulators. They have different formulas of base nutrients for if you're in soil or if you're in hydro or cocoa. They also formulate their base nutrients for if you're using hard water or if you're using RO or soft water. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below. And you can use coupon code MrGrow10DP for a discount on their products. A big supporter of this podcast is Spider Farmer. They sponsor this podcast and I use their LED grow lights. Spider Farmer now has a bar style series of LED grow lights. They have the SE3000, a four bar fixture for a three foot by three foot grow space. The SE5000, a six bar fixture for a four foot by four foot grow space. And the SE7000, a six bar fixture for a five foot by five foot grow space. I will leave a link to Spider Farmer down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt5 during checkout for a discount on their products. Okay, now let's get into the episode. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with grower Joe, Basement Olive Flowers. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Mr. Grow It, man. Chris, I appreciate you for having me on, pal. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We're going to talk all about auto flowers today. That's kind of your specialty, huh? Auto flowers? Yeah, auto flowers are kind of where I started. I've uh, been growing now for about uh, five years full time. And auto flowers were just kind of where I felt like it was going to be made for home growers and have the ability to grow a bunch of different, uh, different plants at the same time. So nice. Makes sense. So we'll get all into kind of how you grow your oil flowers. I know you like to do things in a real simplistic manner. I mean, that's one thing about your YouTube channel, which I'll link his YouTube channel down in the description section below, is there's a lot of basic, good, simple information, which helps beginners, I thought. And your video quality, your production is fantastic. So really good job on that one. And you only have like, I think coming up on like six... 600 subscribers yeah or we we haven't we haven't broke the thousand yet man we're working away we've got a few more over on instagram um but uh right now i'm starting to do it semi full-time so i can stay consistent and put good content out so i can really kind of build a strong community over there so that's the plan 
Cool. Well, I hope that after this video that you'll exceed a thousand, you know, hopefully. That's all. Um, but before we get into the nitty gritty of things, talking about autoflowers, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Absolutely, man. Um, gardening kind of became a passion right away once uh, once uh, medical plants became accessible in my area. Um, I started growing off with autoflowers because those were kind of the only creators online. I uh, started watching Mr. Canuck grow uh, from seed to stone and some guys like that. And autoflowers are what they were focusing on. Um, so I figured, you know what, this is simple enough. I can start this process, try to dial it in so it'll work for me. Um, and it's been successful. We've had some uh, big plants, some small plants, uh, some successful runs and unsuccessful runs. So it's it's been a it's been a good time, man. And I'm just excited to start sharing my information with people because I know there's lots of creators out here. Uh, but like you said, I try to keep it simple and I want to make sure that everyone can try to grow plants um, whichever way they want to. And the main thing is just get them started. That makes sense. Now, are you exclusively an indoor grower or do you also grow outdoors? Um, exclusively indoor for the majority of my plants. Um, I have ran a few runs um, outdoors um, with uh, different cultivars. Um, but most of my success has been in the basement, basement auto flowers. I do everything right down here in the basement um, from filming to growing. Um, so it's it's typically 100% uh, indoor with a little bit of outdoor here or there if I get the itch. Nice, nice. Now, I got to ask, are you a type of grower that chases after yield? Um, do you grow just for variety or what's your goal? Um, well, that's a good question. Originally, it was it was yield. I wanted to make sure that I could get as much as I, I could off a plant uh, because I wanted to try to save money like a lot of growers out there that are growing plants. Um, so initially it was yield, but then it kind of came down to variety, um, different flavors and things like that, that I wanted to try, um, have a variety on standby. So if I had friends and family over that, we could kind of try a few different things here or there and get a mix of everything. And not only that, I think it's cool that when you get different types and uh, the plants take off in different ways, I think that really helps us learn and we can kind of dial in our process so we know how to do it with all different types of plants and not just, uh, the same ones that you're growing over and over again. So it's a bit of both there, uh, but mostly now is variety. Great point. Yeah, I'm a variety grower myself. It seems like we're in a similar situation. I'm actually allowed to gift in my state. I can gift to whoever as long as it's under an ounce. And so right. friends, family, I do grow a variety, and then I'm able to, to gift different varieties to others, which I thought is pretty cool. Yeah, 100%. Man. I, th I think it's important to have variety because, I get excited about what I'm growing, just like a lot of us growers on here. And you get pumped up when you get different colors and different flavors. And to be able to share those with your friends and family and see them laugh and love it and just be so passionate about it that they pick up something and start growing. And I think that's probably the major thing, what, reason why I like it, actually. It's exciting, for sure. So what size pots are you growing your autoflowers in? Um, originally, I started out with a five-gallon because that's what the guys I followed used. Um, and five gallon, it worked for me. I mean, you can, you can definitely dial it in with a five gallon. I found I wanted to get more variety and have more plants. So I moved it down to a three gallon pot. Uh, the three gallon I find fills out perfectly. They're not necessarily getting root bound depending on how big of a yield they are. Yield there they are sorry. Um, so a three gallon I run consistently uh, now across the board. Um, and they're actually my own grow bags that I run, but we won't talk about those. We'll show those later on maybe. All right, yeah, so you're not using the plastic pots, you're using the fabric pots, right? Yeah, so I go with uh, a non, uh, sorry, a non-woven breathable fabric, uh, three-gallon, low-stress training grow bag. Um, I go with a gray color instead of a black. That way there you can see your water penetration. So as I'm watering, it will actually show me how much water is in the pot. So I have less of a chance of overwatering and more chance of watering perfectly so that I can get big and beautiful girls in there, right? Nice, nice. Some autoflower growers, what they'll do is they will plant their seed directly into their final container, or the container that the plant is going to be in for its entire life. Other growers, they will start in a solo cup, and then they'll keep on up-potting. They'll keep on transplanting up into their final container as the plant grows. What do you do? Do you just plant your seed directly into that final pot, or do you transplant up at all? Um, I've done both. I've tried a lot of different scenarios. Um, 
the question can do you transplant no i don't transplant anymore but in the past i have and it can be successful some some of these uh plants love it some of them absolutely hate it um, but if you do it at the right time and you can time it perfectly i think you can have great success over here personally i only had maybe one or two successful runs doing the transplant situation starting in a solo cup moving it up to a one gallon to a three to a five and this is back when i was using the five gallon uh grow bag uh, but now i find being a being a seed i feel like it's best to touch it as little as possible let's put it in its last resting place and try to get a successful run in that place because realistically if, if you're touching it you're putting oil on it you're putting dirt on it you're harming it right off the bat when you put it in its final place so now you're taking that root system and you're moving it which is going to stress it out and you only have a certain period of time for these auto flowers to veg flower until you're ready to harvest so realistically based on my experience i would say don't 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 transplant just put them in their final pot whether it be a three a five a ten whatever pot you want to use, whatever you have on standby. Uh, but I haven't had great success. So I would say, no, I do not do that, Chris. Yeah, I think there's pros and cons to both ways. I mean, you bring up a great point where the, you could come across that stress, right, to where you're, you're transplanting, you get that transplant shock, as a lot of people call it. You're disturbing the root zone, and there is a little bit slow of growth after you transplant. Now, some people swear by doing the transplant specifically to sprinkle some mycorrhizal fungi on the root zone which is going to be an extension of the root zone and helps with nutrient uptake. So there are some people there. It also depends on your situation, I feel like, right? If you have a lack of space, you need to start in smaller containers. All that stuff's going to be fine. But yeah, there is all that overall risk, I think, of transplant shock and reducing your overall yield because any stunting growth throughout the life of the plant for auto flowers, since they're on that kind of set time that it's, it grows, could negatively impact yield. So I think you brought up some great points on that one. But I think, I think you need to try each way if you're starting. Try both and see what works best for you because there's so many variables that come into play. And I might do different techniques in my room than you would do in yours. So try it. I would try everything at least once or twice. And that, that's not just growing. That's everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this. With the starting in this final container, there's that risk of overwatering, right? Do you have any kind of tips for watering as the seedling is just sprouted? Or how do you go about watering? in a large um, pot like that so i typically think that an auto flower needs to get to where it needs to get within the first 22 days to 25 days if they're not where you want them to be at that point then chances are you're not going to get much yield now yeah they'll flower and you'll get some you'll get some uh some flowers from it and you'll get tasty flowers and you'll get all kinds of stuff out of it but at the end of the day if you don't get it to that point it, it's not really going to be worth your while you're going to spend a lot of time so the first 10 days are crucial to me I plant my seed directly into its final container and I dial in my temperatures. I try to be right around 60% of 65% humidity and I try to keep my temperatures around 23 degrees Celsius. That's Canadian. You'll have to transfer that over uh, for you Americans. I apologize. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Um, once they're in those pots and my temps are dialed in for the whole term, all I do is mist my surface with pH water. And I just want to keep my surface nice and moist. I'm not adding any water to the pot at this point. Because realistically, the little amount of water is going to suffocate that root system. And it's not going to be able to grow as quickly as it needs to. So just keep the surface nice and moist. Go in there as many times as you need to throughout the day. And just check. If the surface is dry, quick little mist. Just saturate it. You don't want to soak it. You don't want to drench it. It's just like almost like a little dusting if it was to rain outside and the concrete goes black. That's kind of the way that I describe it. So the first 10 days are crucial. After that, you just want to add little bits of water with a turkey baster just around the, uh, the stem of the system. That looks awkward, but the stem of the system. And you just want to turkey baste around that just a little tiny bit and make sure you're only doing it every couple days. Don't want to overwater because it's crucial to stunt these girls and you're not going to have success. And you're going to get discouraged in the garden. And we don't want that. We want you guys to keep learning and keep growing. So that's the main thing. And that's how I get success in the first 22 days. Good tips. Some really good tips there for sure. Now, what is what are you growing in? What's your media? Are you in soil? Are you in cocoa? What, yeah, what's so in your mix? The, the medium I use, um, when I started, I just wanted it to be affordable. I want it to be really cheap because I had to convince a lot of people to let me do this, right? I had to convince my wife, which is one person, but... 
they can massive out to a lot of people, right? So I had to convince her to let me do it. So cost was the number one problem, right? I wanted to make sure I could do it affordable. So I go with ProMix DX. Um, it's a bagged um, medium that you can buy at any local grow shop. It's got, uh, um, sorry, mycorrhizae in it, which is great for first time growers. And it's cheap. It's about $30 for a bale. And it will fill up uh, about 15 to 23 gallon pots. So you're going to get, number one, a, a good medium that is easy to grow in. Uh, number two, a cheap medium. And you're going to be able to do a lot of plants for a, for a low, low cost. Now, that's $30 Canadian. It's probably even cheaper down, down in the States, I imagine. Um, the reason why I went with that medium is because I wanted something that was simple to use. And a lot of growers on YouTube are using it, too. So I kind of just fell into it, had success with it, and I kind of been running it the whole time. But you probably will see me switch over to cocoa in the near future to give it a run. Um, I was over at one of my buddy's gardens and just the feel of it, it just feels so much cleaner, uh, feels like it's just so much easier to work with. So you'll probably see me transfer over to try that out. I've been growing with the same ProMix DX for a while now, so it would be nice to get a bit of a, a change, I guess, in the garden. So you're just taking straight from the bale. Are you doing any additional amending? Like some people, they'll add in like a perlite or some sort of aeration, additional aeration. Or instead of doing additional aeration, what they'll do is they'll add in some additional amendments, whether it be like organic amendments or, or whatever. Are you doing anything or are you just taking the bale and, and putting it right into the grow pots? Uh, the bale goes right out of my, uh, right out of the bag into a Tupperware container. I just want to make sure I'm breaking it up nice and fine. I do not add anything to the medium whatsoever. It's store-bought and I run it right in my pots. Um, and then we introduce nutrients later on in the grow cycle but nothing whatsoever added it. It's just whatever comes with it is what you get. And it's uh, been working pretty well. So Okay. And then what are you using for nutrients? Um, so the nutrient line that I run with, uh, been with a couple, but the one that I'm running with right now is called Crunk Grow Nutrients. Um, they're a new nutrient line um, on Instagram, um, on uh, amazon.com.ca. Uh, they're right behind me here if you want to check them out. Uh, basically what they are is a, a liquid nutrient uh, to give you kind of a uh, an idea of who they are, they're very similar to some of these top brands like Advanced Nutrients, Green Planet. Um, they're Canadian-made. They're clean products. Uh, there is some salt residue, but I'm not noticing a whole lot compared to some of the other brands I use. And I'm getting great success. So uh, these guys are a sponsor of mine, um, but they are a great product. Uh, check out what I'm doing over on my page. And there's lots of growers that are getting in early trying these guys out. Um, they're pH balanced, but they don't actually advertise that. But for me, perfectly, they pH bang on right where I want to see it. Um, so I'm having great success. I can't say anything bad about them. Okay, so those are the base nutrients. Are there additives in there as well in that line that you're using? Yeah, so I use uh, CalMeg and uh, Micro. I also use Bloom. You do not use Grow with my auto flowers. Grow is off the table. I've used it before, but I... I found it was just raising up my PPM. It wasn't really giving me the growth that I needed in the early stages, so I pulled that out. Um, on top of that, I add a bud booster. I add a microbial product called Monkey Juice, which is a new product here. So this is basically like microbial mass. It's going to uh, help your root system take off in the early stages and make sure that you're going to have a better chance to get big and beautiful flowers. And then the only thing I add on top of this that these guys don't have for a product yet is resin from Green Planet. Um, it's a phenomenal product. I've had great success. I've noticed a tremendous amount of difference from using it and not using it. Uh, they're supposed to come out with a product like that, uh, but we don't see it yet. So Green Planet still in my garden, um, and they'll probably be there for a very long time until something changes because I'm super excited about that uh, nutrient. Okay. And a lot of people, they'll get, you know, especially beginners, they get caught up on the whole feeding thing, when to feed, you know, how much to feed. Is there a feeding chart that you're following that they put out or what? Yeah. So uh, the nutrients come with a feeding chart right on the back of them. Uh, but I do find that a lot of nutrient companies, they're not dialed into necessarily auto flowers, even though they're very similar to photo periods. Um, I do recommend doing a half dose originally until you get into about week three. Um, you don't want to overfeed these girls and stress them out. Um, I, I kind of, I kind of describe it almost like parenting. When you have a, when you have a child, you have a certain period of time until they're 18 and they're on their own. So if you make mistakes throughout that grow, 
chances are something might go wrong. It's the same with thing with an auto flower. So I would do half dose, um, but once you get used to things and get dialed in, um, they can take full dose. I've done full dose and, and had success. It just all depends on what kind of cultivar you get in there and what you're kind of what you what you have dialed in for temperatures and everything. There's so many variables. But if you're on the other side of this and you're getting started with nutrients and you're introducing them, don't panic. Just keep it simple. Follow the chart, half dose, quarter dose, move your way up. And once you get to the top, you'll realize what they can take. I find a lot of us as growers are so passionate about this because at the end you see such a cool product that you're like, you just love it. It's beautiful. So we over complicate things. And I think we're scaring growers away from getting into gardening. And I, and I, that's why I like to keep things simple. Um, and that and a lot of these words I can't even pronounce them just like the rest of you. So uh, keep it simple at first and, and move up, I guess, is the right answer. Now, when you start the feeding? I start my feeding right in week two. So week two is when I start my feeding. Um, that's when I introduce CalMag, Micro, and the Bloom, very small amount of it. Um, two mils per gallon of CalMag, two mils per gallon of the Micro, and then one mil per gallon of the Bloom. And I mix it into a five gallon jug. That way there I got water on standby and I'm watering every other week, increasing my nutrients as we go. I was going to ask if you monitor the PPM or EC at all. Um, I don't monitor the EC, but I do mo monitor the PPM. Uh, for the PPM, I'm just trying to keep it dialed in throughout my stages of my grow. So as a seedling, I want to be anywhere from 500 to 600. Then as we move into veg, I typically bring it up to 800 or 900. Um, and then we're in our flower. I want to keep that dialed in around 1,000 to 1,100. I find if I go up any higher than 1,100, I have pushed it to 12, 1250 before. I just find the girls really don't perform as well in there. You start burning, you start figuring. And then if you do get a, uh, a lockout or deficiency at that point, you've got a lot of nutrients in that soil that you're going to have to try to get out. It's super hard with auto flower. So. Um, I monitor it now. I did just have a very unsuccessful run where I kind of got away from everything. I, I, I didn't really get back to the basics. I wasn't using my pH tester. I wasn't using my PPM. I was just mixing my nutrients the same way I normally did. Um, and we lost a lot of girls. So the main thing is monitor as much stuff as you can. I haven't got into all of the monitoring systems that are out there and all the tools that are out there. But if you can get your hands on tools, definitely advance as you become more and more in tune with your growing style um, and get the proper tools because sometimes we can get over cocky and confident in the garden and then you lose your plants and you don't realize hey i got to get back to the basics so that's a major factor for sure when you talk about the ppm readings that you just mentioned is that the ppm going of your nutrient mix going in bef so before you feed your plant or are you measuring a runoff um, that's so my letting the nutrient Sorry. mix go through the medium run off that measurement or are you doing a slurry test some people do a slurry test for measuring that so my my ppm um to be honest with you I, i'd like to actually chat with you more about that off air um i check mine coming out maybe i should be checking it going in um uh, i'm not 100 percent sure on that uh to be honest with you i just got back into i just got into the ppm about three runs ago um and i'm kind of listening to your podcast some other guys podcasts I'm a learner as well. I'm an enthusiast. And my major thing is to try to keep this simple, to encourage people and to get people into gardening. I'm hoping that they see one of my videos, they get excited, they laugh, they smile, and they're like, you know what? This seems like a lot of fun. This goofy guy can grow, then chances are I can grow. And, and that's the main thing I'm trying to get across. You can get advanced, but for that answer, I really couldn't tell you. Um, I really couldn't get into a technical side of it. It's something that I'm definitely going to have to learn for sure. Yeah. I mean, I can touch on that right now is, you know, I think it's good to have the PPM measurements going in and coming out because going in isn't always going to be what's coming out. You know, you mean you can mix up a 500 PPM nutrient mix and feed it through your medium. Then all of a sudden you're at a thousand runoff. It's because well, you already have nutrients in the medium to begin, right? So it's for like, sure. it's an addition to it. So I recommend kind of monitoring both and you'll get to that comfort level, like you mentioned, where you don't have to really do it as much. You might know like, hey, 
on week four on the feeding chart, you know, this I know comes out, a half dose comes out to 500 PPM. And you can look at, I don't know if you track, if you have like a log of tracking pH and PPM. I, I do. I know not everybody does. Some people get away with not doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that if you want to keep it simple and stuff like that. But I kind of look at my last runoff measurement, you know, whether it be from a couple of days ago um, when I fed or whatever, and kind of get an idea and guesstimate. Like, hmm, do I, am I think I'm going to need... There's no perfect system, you know what I mean? So you got to kind of to guess it and wing it in some senses, at least in my experience. So I didn't think I of think- that because I'm, when I'm mixing my nutrients, all I'm checking is my pH. Um, I didn't think to check the PPM because I'm going based on the guidelines in the back of my nutrient company to tell me what it needs. Um, but super cool because all I'm doing is reading the runoff and basing it on my last runoff and then doing a, an equation in my mind and going, okay, I think there's X amount in that in that soil right now. I need to dial back next feeding, maybe just give water. Um, you'll probably catch me looking over here. I've got two whiteboards here down in the grow room. So I try to track as much as I possibly can so that if I do make a mistake, I can fix it for next run or I can try to dial it in on that run. That's a huge thing. And I think that's super important for new growers. Track everything, even if it's the stupidest thing, when lights go on, when they go off, uh, how much water you give, when you give it. Because all that is just intel, and it's going to help you become a better gardener at the end of the day. Great points, for sure. One last thing to mention for PPM before we move on would be going in isn't always what's coming out. And there's going to be so many variables as well. Like if you're in in an enriched soil or a soil that's already amended, right? Fox Farm Ocean Forest soil is one that comes to mind. There's Roots Organic. There's uh, Coast of Maine. There's so many different of these soils that already come amended with nutrients. And when they're organic nutrients, you know, a lot of those, they're not going to show up on your PPM meter until the microbes break them down. So oftentimes I have beginners reach out to me and they'll say, oh, what I'm putting in, it's way higher runoff coming out. And they're like, and I didn't even feed, like maybe I just watered. And they're like, and my runoff was higher than it was when I fed last time. Well, that's because you probably have organic nutrients in your medium being broken down by the microbes. So that's increasing that PPM number. So there's a lot of variables when it comes to it. Really, this whole PPM thing is is just kind of a tool that you can use to kind of give you an idea of how many nutrients are in the medium. It's it's not perfect by any means. So Um, you touched a little bit on pH. Now, what I want to get a little bit deeper into that. What pH range do you aim for? Um, during the first 10 days, I don't pH my water at all. All I do is I buy distilled uh, baby water from um, the supermarket. And I don't know why I use it. I just started using it originally. I went and bought water because I didn't know what my water was in the tap. Um, but I use regular uh, water, sorry, baby water distilled for the first 10 days. So I don't pH it at all. After that, once I start introducing nutrients, I pH it anywhere from 6.0 to 6.5. But Typically, it runs in right at 6.3. That's kind of where uh, the nutrients pH balance it perfectly. Um, but if it doesn't balance there, depending on what else I'm adding, then I'll use some pH or some pH down um, to kind of dial everything in. But it's typically right there, 6.3, 6.4. Okay, and that's throughout the entire grow? Pretty much throughout the entire grow. Um, flower, I will drop it down to around 6.0. Um, if I can, depending on what I'm adding, I find once I add the resin, it drops it down anyways. Um, now I know you can get a bit more advanced and there's certain nutrients that would take at different pH levels. Um, I try not to really get into all that. I've had success with just pHing at those numbers. Um, and they're producing good flowers that taste good and do get the job done for lack of better words. So, um, that's kind of how I've been doing it over here. Gotcha. Uh, transitioning over let's talk about lighting uh, actually i didn't talk to you about kind of your grow space i know you're in a basement but are yep. you growing in tents or are you just kind of an open basement and then what are you using for lighting um so i've got a, a built room down here uh built rooms out of two by four so it's uh 12 by eight by eight feet high um and then it's panda filmed um with uh panda skin so it's a, a white plastic with a black blacking uh, to keep the light out or keep the light in, I guess, for for whatever way you want to do there. Um, and then I run three lights. So I've got two lights on each side, which are Cronk Row 4000s, which are very similar to the Spider Farm 4000. Um, they call it a 4000, but it actually only pulls 450 true watts from the wall. 
So I got 450 watts on each side, and then I run a Crunk Row 2000 in the middle, which is 250 watts. I only turn the middle light on during flower. I find during flower, I have to space my girls out a bit more, and I'm not getting proper light penetration on all of them. So I put in a filler light just to kind of help them out throw flower. Now I can only run it around 50% um, because of my temperatures down here in the basement, depending on which time of the year I'm growing. We're going into fall now, so I'll be good to run them at full power once we're in flower. But I typically try to keep them right around 70%, I find, is the uh, sweet point so that you don't burn them and you're not getting too much heat in your grow room. Now, the energy emitted from grow lights, PAR, photosynthetically active radiation. It's the energy that the lights emit. Common measurement is PPFD, photosynthetic photon flux density. That's commonly what's used. Some growers, they'll give their plants a certain amount of PAR during the different stages of the growth. They'll, they'll slowly kind of increase the amount of PAR they give their plants. Are you measuring PAR at all? Do you adjust through different stages of growth or, or no? Um, I'm not measuring power. Um, I don't have a power reader or anything like that. Um, but I am giving them different intensities throughout the grow um, and different heights. So I start off around 24 inches above the, uh, above the pots when they're seedlings. And I'm only running it about 20, 25%. So what I mean by that is I've got a dial on the outside of the light. I mean, obviously, you can picture me turning it 25, 50%, 100%. I keep it about 25% value. And then I just gradually move it up and up and up. And your plants are going to tell you, they're going to show you signs of heat stress if they're too hot. And another way to do it that's simple is just put your plant, or sorry, your hand over top of your plant. And if your hand can stand there for a long period of time, the chances are the plants are going to be able to as well. But if your hand's getting super hot and starting to burn, you're going to want to dial it down or raise it up depending on what situation you're in. Um, but I do adjust it throughout the grow, but no power testing whatsoever. I'd be interested to see what these are pulling for par, to be honest with you. Um, how much are those? Are they affordable? Are those things you can order online? Where do you get those kind of testers, Chris? I recommend the Apogee, uh, either MQ500 or the MQ620. I think there might be a different model now. The MQ500 is going to be good for both LED and HID lighting. So HPS, MH, CMH. And then the MQ620. 20 it's an extended range and a lot of these led grow lights these days they're going to extend beyond the normal 400 to 700 nanometer range so that being said they're about the apogee uh, ones that i recommend they're over 500 unfortunately oh wow um, i think it's like 525 for the mq500 and like 575 for the mq620 there are cheaper par ranges out there that i haven't used i heard there's some inaccuracy issues with it so i've just avoided it all together but yeah the tips that you mentioned you can kind of get away with not spending that much money on a par meter just to kind of get your light distance dialed in you can also look at the par chart on the actual grow light listing usually any grow light these days most good grow lights are going to have a par chart on there and it'll show you kind of like a top view it's like a square and it shows you different ppfd levels throughout the footprint and then you can in different heights and you can kind of use that as a guide to determine what the light distance should be. And I feel like 98% of growers probably do it that route and yeah. it's fine. But yeah, they're, they are super expensive, but it's worth it to some who want to kind of play around with things, you know. So. That's a buddy tool. That's, a, that's the type of tool you talk your buddy into buying so that you can borrow it from. <laughs> that's, that's a smart move there. <laughs> light cycle. Let's um, talk about light cycle for auto flowers. So what do you run for light cycle for autos? So the cool thing with auto flowers is you can run any light cycle you want to run. So you can run them for six hours a day, 10 hours a day, 20 hours a day, 24 hours a day. You can put them in your window still and still be successful and grow a full flower. Um, but over here, basement auto flowers, we literally run them like slaves 24 hours a day. Um, and the reason why we run them 24 hours a day is because when I started, I didn't have a timer, so I didn't want to run down and shut them off and not be consistent. I thought that maybe that would mess them up. So I ran them 24 hours a day, and then that's kind of how I dialed in my process. Um, when you're running them 24 hours a day, you can keep your temperatures consistent too. So you can keep your humidity consistent, your temperatures in your room. You can make sure everything's consistent because your lights are really the major factor of heat in your grow room. So having that light off, then you might have to introduce a, uh, a heater. And having that light on, um, you can have a fan in there, an exhaust fan, to make sure that your heat is not getting too high. So 
that's one of the major reasons why I run them 24 hours a day. And, and the other major reason is just I found that it worked the best. I ran them 18 and 6. I've got great results. But 24 hours a day seem to be, you know what, these girls are doing okay. They're having fun. I can go in at any time, so it works good for my schedule. And I can garden at my own leisure. I don't need to wait for the lights to come on or off to kind of get in there and do my thing. So 24 hours a day, we are grinding them out in there. Makes sense. Yeah, I feel like there are pros and cons to 24 hour light cycle, right? You brought up a great pro, which I think is a big pro in my opinion, is the stability in your environment, right? Because once the lights go off, you could have a pretty significant temperature and humidity swing. And too high of swings too often could stress out the plant to the point where it becomes a hermaphrodite, right? So having that stable temperature, humidity, 24 hours a day is, is key. The downside is during lights off, is when plants send down those exudates down to the root zone, the rhizosphere, and then secondary metabolites are also produced during lights off. One of the things, major secondary metabolite is resin, right? The resin production. So I feel like there are pros and cons. I mean, somebody will argue that way, but if you feel like the 24 hour a day is more beneficial for you, the plant will still grow, right? I mean, clearly you're still getting good results and it's keeping your temperature and humidity stable. So either way will work. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's an excellent point. And the biggest thing is being a new grower is your temperatures are super important, right? And they're, they're going to be what stresses you out the most when your humidity is spiking and your temperatures dropping and raising and, and you can't dial that in. You can't enjoy being a gardener. You can't kind of enjoy watching these plants grow. You're worried about everything. You're either spraying the walls down to bring the humidity up or you're filling your humidifier every friggin' day, every second times a day, two times, three times. So just to kind of relax. Maybe start out with 24 hours a day. And if you find you're getting success and you start getting that confidence, then go to 18 and 6. That way there you know what you need. You've already got the right tools in place. Because there's nothing worse than starting to grow. You spend your money on the seeds. You plant them. You get fully invested. And then all of a sudden, you don't have a successful run because you can't keep your temperatures dialed in. That's one of the major mindset of why I went 24 hours a day. But I kind of just stuck there because it, it works perfect for my schedule. I've got young kids, so I need to be in and out of that garden as quick as I can and do it at any time when I get a few minutes to kind of get things done. So, And if you're a new grower just starting out, right, you might not have the money for the equipment, right? Sometimes you might need a dehumidifier, which are yep. big bucks. A humidifier, right, if you're trying to raise that humidity. Heater, potentially, right? If you're just starting out and you don't have the funds for that, well, a 24-hour light cycle may be better for you so you can keep that stable environment so yeah really really good points i'm glad you dove into that deeper so uh speaking of temperature what do you aim for for temperature um i don't like to i don't like to go below 18 degrees celsius and i don't like to go above 29 degrees 30 degrees now there are going to be situations where you have no control over the temperature uh, mother nature is right outside of a basement and a basement is known to retain moisture and heat and cooling depending on what time of year right so it's very difficult to keep it in those ranges, but as long as you've got the proper tools to do it, then you're going to be okay. So we've got uh, AC Infinity fans in there for both intake and outtake. We've got power fans in each corner to make sure that the move, the, the air is constantly moving around. We've got humidifiers in each corner as well to make sure that our humidity can be dialed in. And we've got a heater on standby and air conditioning on standby, depending on which way those fluctuate. So realistically 18 degrees don't go below it and 29 degrees don't go, go above it um, but typically what i find is seedlings are going to like that higher heat um, to try to get them through in that higher humidity and then flowers are going to like those lower temps with that lower humidity um, finishing them out to make sure that you can get uh, perfect flowers without causing any rot or any problems whatsoever um, due to temperature problems and that's 64 degrees to 84 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you working in Fahrenheit. The very few people, right? The very few Americans, right? Is it America yeah. is the only ones that use Fahrenheit? I think it's America. I'm not sure. There's a few things I use Fahrenheit for, but Celsius is uh, how we kind of do all of our temps over here in Canada. And maybe you too. I'm not sure. Humidity. What do you aim for for humidity throughout? Some people do different stages of growth. What do you do? Yep. So stages of growth during the seedling stage, I've got my humidifiers running 24 hours a day. Um, we're trying to keep our humidity 65, 60%, 70 in that range. I don't want to go higher than 70. 
and I don't want to go lower than 60 during the seedling stage. Now, if you don't have a humidifier, some cool little tricks that you can do to keep your humidity up are spraying the walls of your tent. Now, this can be harmful because you can obviously get mold in that situation. Another way is wetting a rag or a towel hanging it from the top of the tent. Um, and a few other ways that you can do it is just clear cups. So buy clear cups from the dollar store, place it over top of your seedling. It's going to help keep the humidity high by the seedling. Um, but my humidifiers help me dial it into 60 to 70% during seedling stage. And then I gradually dial that down once we're into vegetative stage and we know that they're really healthy and they're doing well. We usually drop it right around 55%. And then in the end, uh, flowering stage, anywhere from 45 to 50. And then we like to cure 45 to 50 with uh, a seven to 10 day hang. So humidity is crucial. If I was to tell anybody what tools you should buy first, number one, obviously you need a light. Number two, I would say get a humidifier. Chances are you're gonna have a humidifier before you have a dehumidifier, depending on where you're growing. But if you're in a basement like me, you're gonna need both humidifier and dehumidifier. To make sure that you can keep stuff dialed in. How about CO2? Are you supplementing CO2 at all? Um, the only way that I'm supplementing CO2 is with uh, CO2 enhancers from TMB Naturals. Um, so I've got a few canisters around my room. Um, some people introduce them early stages, uh, but a lot of people would argue that uh, seedlings don't need a whole lot of CO2. Um, I introduce mine around week three. That's when I start bringing the canisters into the room, uh, shaking them on a daily basis, trying to bring my, my uh, CO2 up in the room. Um, they don't last very long. They last about a week to two weeks. Uh, but I do notice a huge difference. I've never tested it to see if it's spiking. Um, my CO2, but based on just my eye appeal, how my plants are performing and how well they're doing, I would definitely recommend trying it out. There's a few different uh, manufacturers out there that are making CO2 products, uh, but TMB Naturals has been a fantastic product for me. Um, they've also got uh, pH up and pH down that I use as well. So if you want to check them out, I would definitely check out them for a, a nice affordable way to introduce CO2 in your room. I use those same canisters. They sent me over a, a box of goodies. And I actually did measure it. And I can speak about that here real quick is my natural CO2 PPM, it's measured in PPM, was like 450 in my grow space. And then I added in the canister and I would often bring it up 800,000. I think the most I've seen is 1200 PPM. So right. it definitely works. I have hung it over the plants as well because they say CO2 is heavy and it kind of sinks down. So you can either hang it above the plants or play the lazy card and just put it on the ground and have a fan blowing it off the ground into your grow space. So I, I've done it both ways. And honestly, I measured it both ways and I didn't see much of a difference. As long as you don't have too big of a space, you could usually get away with one or two canisters, um, which are going to run you anywhere from 30 to $35, I believe, depending on where you live. Um, but that's awesome results. I'm excited that you uh, tested it because chances are in my room with, with the four canisters, uh, I imagine I'm getting up around those levels as well. And you touched upon how seedlings don't need as much CO2. And I kind of just want to go a little bit deeper into this because this is a very common question. There's a general rule out there, and it's actually in my book as well, is like you want air exchange. Every one to three minutes, one to five minutes, if the air is being changed in your grow space, you're in a safe position. Now, if your plants are just seedlings, they're tiny, right? They don't have many leaves in order to intake that CO2, right? So if you're in a four foot by four foot grow space with some seedlings, you're not going to need to change the air that frequently. You can get away with just opening up your grow tent and waving the air in and out once a day, you know, when it's seedlings. I've gotten away with, with that little amount. Now, when your plants grow bigger, has more leaves, uh, maybe it's a four by four tent where it's wall to wall with plants. At that point, you want to have much more frequent air exchange, right? Because they'll eat up that CO2 a lot more quicker. Some people out there, beginners, you might hear, have heard that general rule between one and five minutes, change out the grow space, but just keep your plant size in mind as well, right? 100%. No, those are good points for sure, because a lot of people uh, don't understand that you need a fan to exchange the air in your grow room, grow tent. It's super important. Um, but the major thing is, is, just get started. If you don't have a fan to get started at first, just get in there and start getting everything going, right? So that's a good point. I like that. How about plant training? What plant training techniques do you do for autoflowers? Um, so believe it or not, a lot of people think I'm crazy for this, but uh, I top 
every single one of my auto flowers. I top them every single time. Uh, one top, typically around the fifth or sixth node is when I top them. And that's typically right around day 13, 14, 15, right in that range, depending on which kind of uh, plant I got going on. So I top them and then I start low stress training them. So as soon as I top and that main stem split, all I do is take each node and tie them to the outsides of the bag. So I've got the nice grommets around the grow bags and these tie the plants down perfectly. And all I'm doing is adjusting them accordingly. Now, if you don't top, I still recommend using low stress training. It's one very easy way to produce a higher yield in your plant and get big and better, better flowers realistically at the end of the day. If you don't want to top, all I recommend doing is taking that main node, tying it down, and you just want to go clockwise or counterclockwise and start moving it around your pot on a daily basis. Once it ties down and comes right back up, just move over a node and tie her down and keep moving it around. It's going to allow those bottom branches to kind of come up and give you a nice even canopy. So you get more tops, bigger buds, and more product at the end of the day. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep, good stuff there. Perfect. Do you do anything particular to prevent pests? Um, I don't, uh, but my wife does for sure. Um, my wife is a, is a cleaner. Um, so number one, there's two ways you can get pests. Number one would be having a dirty grow room. So you really need to make sure that you're you're cleaning these tents out or you're cleaning your grow room out. Um, and come up with a solution that works best for you. Now over here, we clean it, we mop it, we wipe it down with soap and water, and then we come back with a peroxide water mix. We spray our walls all down to try to kill anything that's still in there. I know there's some people out there that use bleach and, and things along those lines. I don't bring anything like that into my grow room. And then the major thing is when you're using soil, you don't want to overwater. Overwatering is definitely going to stunt the growth of your plants, but it's also going to invite pest in to lay eggs in your soil, and you don't want pests. Now, knock on wood, I've only had them a few times over here. My wife is very due diligent, and she makes sure that the grow room is thick and span. Um, I made a couple videos where I had like a little bit of dirt on the ground, and she's like, you can't be showing dirt like that. She's the type of mom that like, you need to make the beds if people are coming over, because they're gonna run upstairs and see if your bed's unmade. So pests are, are definitely an issue. You need, to, you need to take precautions, having a clean room, having dry soil, um, well, not all dry all the time, but just make sure that it's not staying wet for too long. That way there, your pests don't come in and take over your grow room. As for uh, sprays and things like that, I have a few things on standby, but knock on wood, I've had pretty good runs with no pests. So I hope you didn't jinx me on this one, Chris. <laughs> yeah, just blame it on me if you get pests, right? Yeah, we'll be, we'll be <laughs> making a video to blame it on you for sure. <laughs> Yeah, you actually have a video on cleaning your grow room. I watched that one. And uh, just to reiterate your mixture here, you had uh, one part, is it hydrogen peroxide to yes. three parts water? Is yes. that right? That's right. Okay. And that'll kill all the bad bacteria, bad and good bacteria, actually. It kind of sterilizes the grow room. Yeah, it's, in a it's sense. basically that... a cheap, affordable way to sterilize your grow room and make sure that if there is any residue or any mold or anything sticking around, that it's going to try to kill it. Um, the other thing is just make sure when you're watering or you're in there with water, wipe up your water immediately. I know sometimes we can get in there and get lazy and we spill a bit of water or we're mixing our nutrients and they'll spill in the tent. Uh, just clean it up. Take the time to really kind of clean all your products, clean your gear and get ready for a new run because there's nothing worse than being halfway through a grow and then you're wondering what's going on and you look underneath your leaves and you got bugs or you got bugs moving around in your soil and it's very discouraging and can really ruin a gardener's experience. So cleanliness is number one over here for sure. All right, a couple more things. So when you're growing your plants, you're feeding your, your autoflowers all the way up until what point are you giving your plant a period of like a flush period or, or leaching? Some people will stop nutrients two weeks prior to harvest, for example. Some people will feed all the way up at the end. What do you do? Um, so what I try to do, so it all depends on when I think the, the autoflower is going to finish. So based on what, what kind of brand uh, you're growing, you're going to find that certain autoflowers are going to be nine weeks, some are going to be 10, some are going to be 12. I try to stop typically two weeks before I think they're going to be finished. I dial back all nutrients and get rid of them completely. And I just start to flush with pH balanced water. Now pH in this water at 6.0 to 6.3 as well. 
Um, and I've got a table set up in there with a mesh top on it. So I take my plant, I put it on top of the, mat, the, the mesh stand, I put a five gallon bucket under it, and I'm soaking it until the runoff is completely running through and I'm getting enough to test down at the bottom. I wanna get my PPM down. I wanna come back down to that, to that seedling stage around four or 500. And if I can even get it lower than that, if I have RO, RO water, sorry, on standby, then I'll even try to get it lower. Uh, but I definitely think a flush makes a huge difference. I've ran a, a test over here where I ran the exact same um, strain and, and tested them. So one was flushed, one wasn't. And you notice a major difference uh, when you try these later on so i do flush and i do recommend it it's just a matter of timing it perfectly so you can get all those nutrients out uh, before they're not taken up anymore and you got to chop and trim and dry and all that terrible stuff that we all hate doing so a common practice before harvesting is to give some folks will give their plants a period of darkness before harvest do you do that at all or not? um to be honest with you I, i'm I have and I haven't. There's all kinds of crazy things out there and speculations. Um, I'm not quite sure if it works. I've done it before. I've also taken ice and put ice on my pot, um, ice the water down so that I, I guess what some people say is that it makes the plant um, think that it's fall and it starts changing the colors and bringing out color content um, and making the plant think that it's done, it's dying. So I have done that too. Um, I've done the darkness. I've done all kinds of craziness in there. I'm actually thinking about putting a spoof video together um, about absolutely ridiculous things that you do to your dance, your, your uh, plants before harvest. I think it'd be funny because we all have so many ridiculous, con uh, ridiculous ideas of what works and what doesn't work. But I don't think there's any science background on it. So we'll have to see. Maybe eventually they'll come out and tell us if it, if it works. Maybe it does. Maybe you know uh, something, Chris. Yeah, I mean, the, the thought process behind it is, uh, you know, I touched on this earlier, is secondary metabolites are, happen during lights off, right? That resin production happens during lights off. So the theory behind it is that it's going to provide more resin on your plants, the trichomes on your plants. Yeah. So, do, we, do we know if it works or is it, is it up in the Some air? Some people have done studies. If you look at, uh, if you search Lost Leaf, I believe it is, he did a study. I think he measured THC. I'm not sure if he measured the... Uh, terpene profile or not i can't remember but he does some indiv his own individual studies i don't think there's been any large studies that have been repeatable that show that so yeah i think it's still up in the air right now so. for sure you see everyone posting it two hours of dark or two days of darkness 48 hours of darkness and uh everyone's getting excited right so uh, we definitely do it i don't know if it makes a difference but in my heart it doesn't hurt in my heart it, it does it makes a difference in my heart <laughs> i don't think it'll hurt the planet at all right it's not gonna no it's not gonna harm it. at all all right so is there any other advice you can think of that you would give people who are new to growing autoflowers um if you're new to growing autoflowers just stick with it um you're definitely going to get little itty bitty babies at first um but the more that you dial in your process the better you're going to get and keep in mind there's a lot of people on these platforms that are growing and they're all doing a fantastic job but there's so many variables that come into play so you can't take a cookie cutter gardening experience and put it into your room and expect it to work. You're going to have to change it up. So the main thing is find a medium that you think you might like, find a light that you're going to like, start picking away at your gear as you get going. You're going to save money eventually. So the main thing is to get started growing so you can have some fun, grow some product and save some money. And at the end of the day, you're going to get better product than you're buying. So realistically, Chris, the main thing is just get started, man. Don't be uh, discouraged by all these awesome growers on these platforms. At the end of the day, we all make mistakes and we just don't show them on our platforms because, well, no one wants to look at a shitty plant, right? Well said, for sure. So wrapping things up, how can listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, listeners can find me over on YouTube. Uh, just started YouTube very, very short period of time ago. I'm trying to put out good content, simple content to try to motivate people to start gardening. Um, you can also find me over on Instagram, Basement Autoflowers. So at Basement Autoflowers on Instagram. That's where I put uh, a lot of my comedy, some fun stuff, some giveaways. Um, and that's where you'll find my grow bags. So the low stress training, Basement Autoflowers grow bags, three gallon, five gallon available. And they come with the built in low stress training grommets. And coming up, you're going to have a chance to win this championship belt. So it's going to be a Basement Autoflowers Autoflower Grow Off. And we're going to give this to the top grower. We've got a sponsor set up for seeds. 
and we're going to base it on uh, look. Um, and if you're in Canada, you're going to send it in. We're going to do a THC test, a flavor test. And we're going to crown a champion of the Basement Auto Flowers belt. So all kinds of cool stuff coming up. I appreciate you for having me on, Chris. Thank you guys so much, man. I really appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, thanks for coming on. A lot of fun stuff coming up there. I'll link your channel down in the description section below on YouTube. If you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, you can just search Basement Auto Flowers and his channel comes up. I'll also link down your grower's bag. I'll link that down. I'll put an Amazon link. It's on Amazon, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'll put that down there too so you guys can check out his grow bag. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. Try to get as many thumbs up as possible. Leave a comment if you enjoyed it. Share it. Sharing is caring. So if you feel somebody would benefit from this information, please share it. And then last thing would be if you are listening in on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. We're going to be working our way up to 200 ratings and reviews. I think we're at like 113, 114 right now. So we got a little ways to go. If you're tuning in on Apple Podcasts, I would greatly appreciate if you left a rating and review. Grower Joe, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. Super appreciative. We're actually going to have you on From the Stash podcast as well. So we'll definitely uh, get you on there soon. Just need to fit you into the schedule. And yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome, brother. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Thanks.